Hey everybody and welcome to our module section on fallacies. Fallacies are absolutely fun and they're intuitive. Uh, once you see a few, you manage to get the hang of them and you can see them in lots of different contexts. By no means are the fallacies presented here the only ones that we could talk about. There are lots and lots of fallacies and there are new ones that are sort of generating here and there. Um, what, what are fallacies? What, really, it's when bad arguments appear good. You're making a mistake in reasoning when you have a, a fallacy, right? Um, and so um, something seems like it's pretty good. It might be a convincing takedown of somebody, but actually on closer inspection, maybe there's something wrong with the form of the argument, or maybe there's a problem of relevancy, psychological relevance, um, versus logical relevance. So they're not really good ways to argue. And the best way to kind of um, learn about them is just to learn their names and to learn what they are. This is the fifth and final component of our logic section, the last little number down there, argument fallacies. So let's get crack a lacking. Uh, a fallacy is an error in reasoning. It's a mistake in reasoning. You're trying to do something, but then you don't do it properly. It's a mistake in reasoning. It's an error in reasoning. And fallacies typically take two shapes. Uh, they are either formal fallacies, where they have the wrong structure, or they are informal fallacies where the content is somehow wrong. Um, let me give you an example of, of a formal fallacy uh, where the structure is wrong. And this might look uh, somewhat familiar to you. If P, then Q, not P, thus not Q. Now you might say to me, gosh, look, I don't even know what you're talking about with P and Q and what this all is. All that I'm saying is, P is any statement and Q is any other statement, right? If P, then Q, not P, thus not Q. It doesn't matter what statement, remember a statement is a thing that is capable of being true or false, I put in there. It's, it's because the thing is built wrong, it will always be a bad argument. Now, that's different than something like an informal fallacy, uh, where you'd have a fallacy of composition or division, which looks like this, right? Here the content is wrong. Note this. Premise one, the Brooklyn Bridge is made of atoms. Premise two, atoms are invisible. Conclusion three, thus the Brooklyn Bridge is invisible. Well, this is not correct. Uh, look, one is correct. Two is correct, but three does not follow. Um, this has to do with the fallacy of composition. Just because the members of a group have a property doesn't mean that when you take the group as a whole, it will then have that property. Um, as for formal fallacies, we're only gonna do two, really the two big ones, and this is pretty much what you've got. There might be some variations, but uh, the first is called affirming the consequent. And the second is called denying the antecedent. Now these are fancy names, right? But they're formal, right? With a bow tie, meaning the form is wrong. So uh, note this one, premise one, if A then B, B thus A. Now let me pop this into an argument in natural language and you'll see the error right away. If I have the flu, then I have a sore throat. I have a sore throat, thus I have the flu. Well, you might have a sore throat, but you have a cold, not the flu. And so the idea is, when you affirm the consequent of the conditional in line one, uh, that's not gonna be enough to give you the conclusion which is the antecedent, which is that you have the flu, which is the first part of premise one. Okay, um, ooh, there's a repeat on that. Um, the second formal fallacy that we will look at is called denying the antecedent. Denying the antecedent looks like this. If A, then B, not A thus not be. And I'll give you a great example as to why this doesn't work. Um, again, it's, it's presented in this way to you where you see A, where A is a statement variable standing for any statement, which is a sentence that's capable of being true or false, because I could pop in any, to, any statement for A and any statement for B. It doesn't matter what it is. If it's taking this form, then this will be a fallacy. And I've had discussions in my life where I've pointed this out to people and they'll say, you don't know anything about physics. You don't know anything about biology. And I say, I don't need to. I, I know something about logic 
not much, but I do know something about it. And I can tell you that the way that you've built this building, it will not hold up. And so the form of the argument is wrong. Um, so take, for example, this one. If a nation has the atomic bomb, then it will kill people. This nation does not have the atomic bomb. Thus, the nation will not kill people. Well, okay, that's false. Nations have been killing people even though they never had the atomic bomb. It doesn't matter what I put in for the statements A and B. Again, it's the form that's wrong. It's the way that it's built that's wrong. Okay, now we're going on to the informal fallacies. And you can divide up informal fallacies into all sorts of fun and neat and interesting groups. But we're just not going to do that. And the reason why is it's more important that you recognize the fallacies than that you can label it as, as it's whatever sort of fallacy of weak induction or fallacy of relevance or something like that. Don't worry about that. Worry about the name and what's going on. Okay, the gambler's fallacy. Um, this fallacy is sort of, it states that the conclusion of an argument depends on the assumption that independent events are causally related. Um, so, uh, if you've ever gone to Las Vegas, you've seen the roulette wheel spinning and you'll see, or even Laughlin or someplace like that, or even right. Any of the casinos here in, in California, you'll see that there's a, usually a big display of the black and you know, what the house has rolled on any particular, you know, the last 25 rolls, it's been two reds, three blacks, you know, two reds, two reds, something like that. And people will look at that sign and say, oh, man, the, the, you know, the, the house has rolled black five times in a row and they've spun it around, right? And so I'm going to, um, I'm not going to bet on black because red is going to come up. Look, this is a fallacy because each individual spin is an independent event in the universe and they are totally independent. And so as an example, um, in Monte Carlo, in August the 18th of 1913, um, they rolled 26 blacks in a row, in a row, right? Um, and so it, it's just a sort of fallacy. Sometimes this comes up when people are talking about sports and they'll say, oh gosh, uh, they've won five in a row, they're due to lose the sixth. Well, if you assume that these are independent events, every game is an independent event, then that's a fallacy, right? That's not correct. Um, of course, you, you could make an argument that these are sequential events, certainly in the event of something like sports, because it might have to do with durability of athletes and whether or not they're injured or something like that. Okay, next up, the false cause fallacy. I love this one. And there are a couple of different ways to articulate versions of it. Um, but we're going to start with this one. The correlation is not causation um, fallacy. Uh, the false cause fallacy is the incorrect, the easy for me to say, the incorrect claim that a real or imagined relationship is causal, meaning it has to do with cause and effect. Now, my favorite example for this is something like um, uh, the following. If you look here at this graph, you'll see the global average temperature um, over here on the y-axis. I always get it wrong when I say this. And then right here along the x-axis, there are the approximate number of pirates in the, United, in, in the world. So in 1620, there are roughly 35,000, right? 45,000, um, 200,000 pirates, right? And um, eventually what begins to happen is the number of pirates in the world is lower and lower and lower, right? So here it's a bunch of pirates and now it's getting, as it's moving across, you're looking at me, it's becoming lower and lower. And what's happening is time is moving on and the average temperature of the earth is increasing. Well, big deal. So what, who cares? Well, the, the conclusion is inescapable, right? It's that the more pirates we have, the colder the average temperature of the earth. And so clearly you can conclude that pirates are cooling off the earth. And if we want to cool the earth, we need to generate more pirates because this, okay, this is obviously insane, right? Nobody would say this. 
another example that people love to use is something like um, the number of people who eat rice and have dark hair, right, is, is very great. And so there's this correlation between the number of people who eat rice regularly and the color of hair. And they say it's, in, it's indisputable then that eating rice causes darker hair. Well, okay, that's absurd, right? You have certain, like China, right, would be a huge skew to statistically there. And nobody in their, in their wildest dreams would say eating rice causes your hair to darken. That has nothing to do with it. But there is a correlation there between right, those two things. And so you have to be very, very, very careful when people start talking about statistics. You got to have your ear up because it's real simple to look at two things that seem to be correlated and assume that one causes the other. Another example of this would be crime rates and the teaching of evolution, right? People say, oh, crime is going up as evolution is being taught. Right? Okay, no, right? Um, but, but these sorts of arguments are out there. And so anytime you're noting someone is making a causal claim, you need to be careful and you need to make sure that it's really well substantiated. Another false cause fallacy is called post hoc ergo propter hoc. Now that's Latin, and I'm sorry to do that to you. Um, but what it really is saying is just because one event precedes another event, the first event does not cause the second event. So the classic example of this would be someone would say, boy, you know, I had this terrible cold. I drank rose water and my cold got better. Well, look, you're going to get better from a cold anyway. You don't have any evidence as to how you would recover had you not drinking the cold, the rose water. And so you can't really conclude that drinking the rose water made your cold get better. Um, another instance of the false cause fallacy is oversimplification, claiming that an event has only one cause when there are demonstrably many. So some people say something like mental illness killed John F. Kennedy. If you're not familiar, John F. Kennedy was assassinated um, during his presidency um, by Lee Harvey Oswald, and he was shot in broad daylight in, in Dallas's Dealey Plaza. Um, and sometimes people say, look, guns didn't kill JFK, right? Uh, mental illness did, the mental illness of Lee Harvey Oswald. Well, no, this is wrong, right? Th these are concurrent causes. Something was wrong in Lee Harvey Oswald's head and he had a gun. Um, neither one of them would have been enough on its own. You needed both of them in this particular case to, to result in the assassination of JFK. This is an important point because otherwise you stunt rational discussion of an event. Right? If you're only addressing one side of a debate, if you're only looking at one cause of a debate, then you will never remove it or remediate it or, or properly address it. Um, so this is an important fallacy. Okay, the next one is the fallacy of composition, one of my faves. This is the reverse of the fallacy of division. Um, just because something is true of parts does not mean it is true of the whole. All right, so fallacy of composition. Premise one, each ball weighs one pound. Premise two, there are eight balls in the bag. Conclusion three, thus the ball, thus the bag weighs one pound. Now, you might think this is insane, and I understand how this looks, but it's, I think it will be super helpful um, because it will, it will let me explain uh, another application of this argument. It's kind of slippery. What I'm saying here is, I'm saying, look, I have a ball, I have a bag, each ball in the bag weighs a pound and there are eight balls in that bag and if I take the bag all together it would weigh one pound. Now this seems totally ridiculous. You'd say look it weighs eight pounds plus the whatever the bag weighs, right? Certainly that's correct. But notice if I give you something that's called the cosmological argument and I say each event has a cause, right? So each event has a cause. Um, the universe is the totality of events and therefore, right, the universe has a cause. Ah, that would be fallacious, right? And people like that version of the argument sometimes because they use it as a cosmological argument for the existence of God. 
that particular formulation of it is fallacious. It's, it's not good. You could probably soup it up and change it and it would be better. But, um, but I just want to show you that this, this takes place all over the place. Um, next up, the fallacy of division. Um, just because something is true of a whole, a collection of parts, doesn't mean it's true of individual members of the whole, right? This is the reverse of the one I just explained. This is the reverse of composition. So uh, you might say, premise one, the Lakers have the best team. Conclusion, thus the Lakers have the best point guard, shooting guard, small forward, power forward, center. Um, that would be wrong, right? Look, somebody might have the best baseball team or football team or soccer team, but it doesn't follow from that that the players at each individual position are the best. Rather, they work better together than other teams that might have better individual players that lack the cohesive and uh, shared mentality and game plan and teamwork, right? All right. Um, fallacy of begging the question. This can take a couple of forms. We're just going to cover one. Um, the fallacy of begging the question. Um, premises assume the truth of the conclusion rather than establish it. So um, somebody says here, right, suppose I want you guys to join this napkin religion club at Long Beach City College. And I say, the napkin religion is the one true religion because it says so right here on this napkin. And I show you that and I say, look, this is the proof that the napkin religion is the best and you need to join the napkin club. This is the way it goes. And you'd say, look, no, right? <laughs> this, I, I can't say that this is proof because this assumes what we want to establish, which is whether or not the napkin religion is the best one. Um, this is why sometimes people will have um, attempts to do archeological digs to substantiate claims of, you know, the Bible or the Quran or something like that. People will find the Bodhi tree mentioned in a certain sutra or something like that. Um, it's an attempt to provide evidence that correlates um, or somehow links up as trace evidence or something like that to events in a, a sacred text. So uh, again, we're, we're not talking about religious beliefs in this class, but this is a good way to see the fallacy of begging the question. All right, next up, false dilemma, the fallacy of false dilemma. The premise of an argument presents only two options when others are available. Um, Suppose a student comes in on a Monday, Wednesday class, they miss Monday, they come in on Wednesday, and the moment they come in, I say, oh, I thought you cared about this class, but you weren't here on Monday. And they would say to me, look, um, just talk to the fist or whatever. Um, the only options here are not, I care about this class, or I attend, right? It could be that I was in a car accident and so I couldn't attend, right? There's a third option there. Anytime you are arguing with somebody and you're faced with only two options and they're both bad, you should sniff and look for a third option because there's probably a way to split that dilemma. Um, I don't want to get too much into this now, but this does happen with something called Euthyphro's Dilemma. So this is just for your own edification, but you should see the diversity of fallacious reasoning, right? It occurs in all sorts of areas. Um, there's this um, discussion in Euthyphro, which is a Socratic dialogue, where um, Socrates is talking to Euthyphro and they're talking and, and essentially they, they, they start discussing what is, what is good, right? And Euthyphro tells Socrates, well, good is doing what the gods say to do, right? So we might formulate this in a monotheistic religion as saying something is good if God commands it, right? So God commands something and then that makes it good. And this might conform to something like the Ten Commandments or something like that. Okay, um, and that seems to make sense, but there's a problem here. Um, and Socrates points this out. He says, wait a minute. Um, is it good because God commands it? Or does God command it because it's good? And in the first case, right, where you say it's good because God commands it, uh, you could run into trouble here, right? Um, all of a sudden, maybe God changes it to the nine commandments. Um, and murder is left off or something. Well, it doesn't seem like then we'd say, hey, all right, murder, you know, or kill. Yeah, awesome, right? It doesn't seem like God commanding something would necessarily make it good. 
Um, that seems to be wrong. So, but the problem here is notice if you move off that horn of the dilemma and you say, okay, God commands it because it's good. Well, now it looks like there's some kind of standard outside of God that God is appealing to, or there's some standard that God cannot change and God's supposed to be all powerful. And now that looks like a problem. Um, now look, this is a, a classical dilemma issue, right? You choose A, bad news. You choose B, even worse, right? What do you do? Well, you look for a third option. And so people say, look, um, it, God commands something because it's in his nature, not because it's good and his commanding it doesn't make it good. It's God commands it because it's in his nature. And that's an attempt to forge a third alternative to just a simplistic kind of dilemma style argument. So if you didn't follow that, it's fine. Just know that anytime you're arguing, um, if there are only two options, look for a third. All right, equivocation. Um, conclusion of an argument depends on the fact that a word or phrase is, phrase is used either explicitly or implicitly in two different senses in the argument. Um, this bloat is here and he says, so much for the theory that carrots will make you see better, right? And the joke is that obviously carrots put in your eyes don't make you see better, but a diet with, you know, vitamin K or whatever's in it uh, will make you feel better or will make you see better. Um, that's using sort of the same term or same phrase in two different ways. Um, I have a great illustration here from the Book of Bad Arguments book in the public domain, uh, the queen told the curious little crane that she could have jam every other day, but never today since today was not any other day. Ha ha ha. Um, sometimes equivocations are really tough to detect and it can take centuries for people to say, oh, um, Descartes actually means a couple of different things here when he says the word ideas and this has a dramatic impact on, you know, X, Y, Z. Um, by the way, that comes up in law quite frequently. It looks like sometimes things are different and um, used in a different way. Okay, uh, today is a Sherlock Holmes mug here, 221B Baker Street. It is my lovely wife's cup, so she's letting me use it. Okay, she doesn't know. Um, as long as I wash it, it's fine. Uh, here we go. <laughs> Conceptual slippery slope. This one's a classic. It's also known as the Sorites Paradox. Um, you don't need to know the story behind Sorites. It has to do with, you know, how many pieces of straw make a haystack, right? Um, okay, an argument relies on the claim that because we cannot distinguish a degree of difference A from B, we cannot draw a distinction between A and C. I think a very clear application of this type of fallacy you can find in some well-intentioned but misguided literature where somebody says, evolution is false, right? Have you ever seen a fish become a bird? Come on! Well, look, that's not what evolution is, right? It's a, it is a long, slow process, right? Descent with modification subject to environment. And so you have these very long stretches of time, right? A fish will never become a bird. Um, a chicken will never become a bear. It just isn't going to happen. Um, but just because we can't distinguish any one particular generation of offspring doesn't mean that we can't say that there isn't a difference between a chicken and a bear or something like that, right? Um, so, yeah, that's an example. Uh, another one, slippery, slippery slope, it's not really conceptual. It tends to be more false cause-ish, um, is when someone makes an argument that relies on this extraordinary chain reaction of events, right, for which there's just insufficient reason to think that these things will actually occur. So before same sex was recognized by the United States Supreme Court, um, you, you people would make this argument frequently. They say, look, if you allow people to marry, uh, the next thing you know, everybody's going to be smoking crack in the street and uh, it's just going to be chainsaws and broken glass. That's it, right? And this idea that, you know, this would be some kind of nihilistic end. It would be like, um, oh, what's that movie where everybody has to break a law or something like that? Anyway, don't worry about it. Um, 
And you just have to be mindful. This happens a lot in policy debates. People will make an argument, if we make such and such change to this regulation, then it's going to have this catastrophic effect. And you need to make sure that there is a tight relationship that exists between the change or what they're proposing and the actual event. Or are there a series of things that occur in between? Okay, uh, next up is the ad hominem abusive. Um, this is just a case where someone makes an argument on the basis of verbal abuse. Um, I recall a, a case when I was in law school, we were having this protracted debate about, um, I think it was border security, and there was a lease that was coming up for a certain port somewhere in the United States, and a foreign company was going to, a company that was not a, an American company was bidding, to run the port, right? It was a commercial enterprise. And somebody said, look, this is a total, this jeopardizes completely our, our national security. Um, we, we need to be very careful. And I, I said, well, look, I don't know that that's correct. There are huge portions of our border that are totally unmonitored. You know, they literally stretch for miles and miles and miles and nobody knows what's going across that, right? Um, and this person had said, well, you're, you're an idiot. Right. And, and the moment that, that that was said, the professor said, OK, OK, we're good. We, we know who won this. Let's go on. The idea is if you have to insult somebody, you've lost because you're no longer discussing the, the debate. And by the way, you might actually think that when you're arguing with someone, they're of lesser intelligence. That's the only way to explain their position. You might also think that they just don't have enough information, or you might think that they're evil, right? These are common assumptions. They seem to be the only way to explain how somebody could support a political position that seems so unreasonable to you. Be careful, that's not correct. Try to stay to premises and conclusions. Try to stay for reasons and, um, and, and what those reasons actually establish or show. Okay, a classic example of the ad hominem abusive, again, from the Book of Bad Arguments. Your ad hominem attacks are evidence that your arguments are baseless, wrote user 226. Rodney began typing his reply. You appear to be too stupid to understand the difference between an insult and an ad hominem attack. Remember, the idea here is that um, an ad hominem attack is, is baseless, right? It, it doesn't have anything to do with the premises and the conclusion, and so you, you need to be mindful of that. Uh, there is another kind of fallacy that is called an ad hominem. It's called an ad hominem circumstantial. Um, you've got to keep your eye out for this one. I have done this about a thousand times before I learned about this fallacy. Um, it's when you, you know... Um, you're showing an opponent or a fellow arguer or a position due to circumstances or interests is likely to uh, argue a certain way and therefore doesn't have a valid argument. So you might say something like, Romney's health care plan will be terrible because he's a Republican. Well, actually, in point of fact, Obamacare and Romney care have some significant, not a total overlap, but some significant provisions of overlap. Um, you can't judge the content of a thing uh, from where it comes from. This is kind of a form of the genetic fallacy. People might say, don't don't trust that bill from the NRA. It's a terrible bill. It might be a great bill. You'd have to read it first, right? The origin of the thing doesn't determine its its quality. It might make it likely or unlikely that it's good or bad, but it doesn't guarantee it. <laughs> okay, next up we have ad hominem association. I put another picture of Romney up there um, only to signify um, the, that this comes out a lot in political arguments. Um, an ad hominem by association fallacy is um, an argument or view P is viewed negatively because that view or argument P is associated with another group. So an example here is Stalin was against religion. Clean is also against religion. Therefore, clean is as bad as Stalin. Um, I heard somebody make this argument in media once. They said, look, uh, Donald, uh, you know, you voted for this president. The KKK voted for this president. For the rest of your life, you voted the same way as the KKK. Um, look, I mean, nobody wants to be associated with the KKK, but you, you have to be careful, right? Because 
what makes something bad or good isn't that other people did it, right? Other people do things that are either the same or different from you, perhaps for totally different reasons. Remember, the whole point here is to maximize our true beliefs and minimize our false ones. And we can't, we can't commit these kinds of fallacies. And if we commit an ad hominem association, the person that we're harming the most is ourselves. And so you might feel like, look, this, this, this is different, by the way, than someone who is expressly endorsed by a political group that you may disagree with. And, and they say, yes, I agree with this political group, right? And you're like, wait, I don't like this because this political group is, you know, too radical or something like that. Well, that's a little different, right? But you need to be careful. Just because there's an association doesn't then mean um, that you can, you can attribute the negative qualities of that group to this other individual. All right. Hope that came out. Tu quo cu. Okay, this is called the U2 fallacy. Um, assuming an argument or claim is wrong because an arguer acts inconsistent with that argument or claim. Um, so you might imagine that's Frida Kahlo, and in the picture she's smoking a cigarette, but I don't know if that's actually real. Uh, it seems a little dubious to me. That smoke ring, I don't know, that smoke just seems... It could be legit, I don't know, but I just, I picked it for the cigarette, okay? Someone's smoking a cigarette and they say, smoking is bad for your health. And you don't say, well, you're smoking, so that's false. No, um, look, it may be true that smoking is bad for your health. In fact, it is, right? It statistically increases your chance of risk, heart attack, cancer, cardiovascular diseases, all that stuff. Um, and the fact that somebody's smoking does nothing to affect that claim. Um, so just be careful of that. Um, by the way, Cleve makes this long drawn out, dis well, it's not long and drawn out. He discusses this case of two politicians. They're discussing special interests. Don't just, we're getting out of that one. Okay, the genetic fallacy. Um, this is kind of like ad hominem circumstantial. Claiming that a position or argument is weak only on the basis of its origin. Don't support the car safety bill now in Congress. It was written by car companies. Well, it might be a good bill, right? Um, uh, you have to be careful. Uh, someone might say, yeah, this is very similar ad hominem circumstantial. Not exactly the same, but pretty close. All right, appeal to consequences. Claiming that the consequences of an action or position solely determine whether it's right or wrong. Now, um, there are cases clearly where consequences inform the morality of a case or the rightness or wrongness of a decision. But when you say it is the only thing, right, then you've run aground. If you say, look, we're going we're gonna to have this huge revolution and we're going to become the napkin, napkin nation. And we're going to have to take out a lot of people, but it'll be worth it because in the end we'll be the napkin nation. Um, Anytime you're saying that the ends justify the means, you may be committing this fallacy. Okay, next up, appeal to authority. Um, claiming that a claim or position must be true on the basis that some party said it. Um, once in class, I had a student ask me, uh, do, you know, do you believe in God, Professor Vitt? And I said, I, it's not how you answer that question, right? Um, you, you'll have to figure that out for yourself, looking at arguments and evidence and reading all sorts of people and looking in your heart and doing that for yourself. Um, what I say doesn't make that true or false. And so very often people want to do this. They, they want to, um, to just rely entirely on what someone says. Now, it's fine and normal to have expert authority. Remember, that's a type of induction that we talked about. Um, but you have to be careful just because somebody says something doesn't then make it true, right? Um, another case is a little more slippery. It comes up sometimes with advertising, appeal to wrong authority. Relying on an authority statement is true without recognizing that the authority lacks the relevant expertise, education, or experience. Um, so you might have somebody who says, you know, I'm not a doctor, but I play one on TV. Okay, well, if you're not a doctor, then you shouldn't be talking to us about medical supplies and saying that these are the best medical supplies or whatever it is. Um, this happens often. Somebody writes a book, 
right? They'll write a book about history or something, and they have a PhD in physics. And historians read, you know, maybe it's very popular publicly, but somebody reads it and says, you know, maybe you're a great um, physicist, but you're a terrible historian. Uh, so anytime this is true in academics, right, you have to be very careful. Somebody working outside their field could really, really run aground on some basic, basic fundamentals that they miss because they lack a kind of rigorous, systematized, formal introduction to a body of knowledge. Um, that's super important. So be careful. Is the person who's making the claim qualified to make that claim? Um, so here's a great example from the argument, the book of bad arguments. Peculiarly, Professor Chimp, the world's most distinguished living chemist, is often quoted about matters of fidelity. Right. Uh, years ago, there was a woman who was on the radio and she would say, doctor, I'm doctor this. Right. And um, the implication was always that she was a doctor and she had a degree in psychology and physical therapy. She didn't. She had a degree in kinesiology. She didn't know anything about. Right. She wasn't she wasn't professionally qualified to, to sort of dole out psychological advice. Um, she might have been good at it, but she didn't have the right authority to do so. And the problem, again, is unless you have the formalized, rigorous, systematic introduction to a subject, you can miss something really, really, really basic or obvious. Um, okay, appeal to fear. Now, we talked about appeal to force earlier. Appeal to fear is, is a little different. Sometimes they're the same. Um, claiming that a position is correct on the basis that its alternative is fearful. So Mr. Frog lost the election after Mr. Donkey convinced everyone that if Mr. Frog became the school dean, soon enough the entire university would be run by frogs. And the idea here, it's not an appeal to force. Nobody's being forced to do something, but people might be fearful of a bunch of frogs running the, the, um, the university. And so this is appeal to force, right? Sign this contract or I will shoot you. That's sort of a of a harken back to a, the Godfather movies, right? He makes him an offer he can't refuse. You sign this paper, or I'm gonna, you know, kill you. Um, it's fallacious because whether or not you should sign the paper, ha maybe has to do with other things other than you know being killed, right? Um, so that's that's the appeal to force fallacy. This is a big one: appeal to tradition or ancient wisdom. Claiming that a position is true on the basis that it has been done frequently in the past. Um, I, I brought up a picture of Vampyra there. You may recognize her on the right. And the reason why I bring up Vampyra was she was sort of a, um, a I guess you'd say a proto-feminist figure in early American culture. By early American, I mean 1954, right? Not that early. Um, and she was the opposite of tradition. Um, in her day... The, the nuclear family sort of was the social unit for America. And Vampyra came on the scene and she was not defined in relation to a man or to family. In fact, she had a very sort of funny quote. She, she said, oh, children, I love children. They're delicious. And the idea was she was trying to tear down tradition. The general idea here, and there's lots more, right? I could give a whole speech on that. But the, the idea here is that um, just because something has been done a certain way in the past doesn't mean we should continue to do this thing that way. If you've ever read The Lottery by Shirley Jackson, that's a great example of this. Um, there's this lottery that goes on in this town and, and, you know, people are sort of, first people are excited about it, but then people are kind of hedging and they go, I don't... Yeah, I don't know if we should really do this lottery anymore. And so we got it. We always been doing the lottery, right? And it turns out the lottery is just that some one person gets picked every year and that person gets killed. And the idea is, why are they doing it? Well, they're not doing it for any reason at all. The only reason they're doing it is because they've always done it this way. And so part of philosophy is questioning tradition. This goes way back to, to Socrates, right? It's, it's not that tradition would be wrong. It's just that we need to understand better the reasons why we are doing things. Tradition might be right for reasons we don't understand. Uh, there's an example of this involving ancient Egypt. The, um, 
uh, it was funny. They had found some um, some makeup that had lead in it that the Egyptians were using. It was in a tomb. I don't know if it was King Tut's tomb, but it was a tomb. They found this makeup and somebody tested it and said, oh gosh, it has lead in it, some kind of lead compound, and it wasn't bound very well. And they figured, well, these poor Egyptians were giving themselves lead poisoning, right? Uh, without knowing what they were doing, you know, they shouldn't have been taking this makeup. And then someone else went back years later, like decades later, and tested the makeup and found out that the makeup actually contained a, uh, it had this property. The property it had was that it would destroy parasites that were present in the, in the waters of the Nile. And so it might have been that Egyptians were using this for the right reasons to block out the sun and it had these compounds, but they didn't necessarily know what those reasons were. So again, just because something has been done a certain way in the past doesn't mean it's the right way to do it. Also, appeals to ancient wisdom, you have to be very careful. Um, people in the past didn't have the same level of scientific knowledge that we do now. And so if they were doing something, they were almost certainly doing it for the wrong reasons or incomplete reasons. And so somebody saying this tea was been drinking for thousands of years, you know, you need to be very careful. It, it may be that it was, but that doesn't make it the right thing to do or the best thing to do. Next up, appeal to popularity, claiming that a position is true on the basis that the claim is popular. Um, if you look at, and I, this is a strange example, I probably should have changed it, but we we're sort of going with the horror theme and logic, so I went with it. Um, Teen Wolf 2 was commercially more successful than uh, earlier werewolf movies, right? More people saw it, but if you ask film critics, they would not agree that Teen Wolf 2 was a better film than earlier werewolf movies. And so just because something is popular doesn't mean that it's true, right? That's an important point. Um, okay. The accident fallacy, applying a general rule to a specific instance to which it was not intended to apply. So uh, here's an example. Cutting people with knives is a crime. Surgeons cut people with knives, therefore surgeons are criminals. Well, no, clearly this is a, an exception, right? Medical practice is, is uh, not criminal. It's not part of the criminal code at all. But um, you have to be careful when somebody takes a general rule and it tries to apply it to a specific instance and they're doing so, they sort of warp the truth of the statement. Okay, red herring. A red herring is a fish. You see this red fish here at the bottom. This is really argument by distraction. But it's by making an arguer discuss an irrelevant point. Variations of this are called the smokescreen. Um, they're essentially the same thing. It's when you say something like, uh, Senator Carp thinks the speed limit is too fast, but cars are very gas efficient nowadays. Well, look, the speed limit probably has to do with safety, not gas efficiency. It's irrelevant, but you can get people off talking about gas efficiency instead of the position. You know, someone might send out a tweet and instead of talking about the substance of a policy, they're talking about, oh, this person wrote this tweet and it's all spelled wrong. Ha, ha, ha. Well, the joke's on you, right? It's all a red herring. It's just a smoke screen. It's just a smoke screen. Okay, appeal to ignorance. Um, this one comes up a lot. Um, arguing that a claim is incorrect on the basis that nothing is known about that particular claim. This is Ancient Aliens. I don't know if you've ever seen that show. I, lo I love that show. I watch it all the time. There's actually a book by Eric Von Doniken called Chariot of the Gods. There's an earlier book that's very similar, but um, Chariots of the Gods is, is essentially um, a, uh, a book in which Eric Von Doniken looks at things like Egyptian cotton and says, gosh, you know, how did the Egyptians loom this cotton? They, they, they were just a primitive people. Uh, they, they must have, uh, you know, they must have gotten this technology from outer space. How, how did the Egyptians build these pyramids, right? Um, they, they must have gotten help from outer space. Well, if you don't know how they built the pyramids, then you don't know how they built the pyramids full stop. 
if you look at the development of Egyptian tombs over time, you'll see that the pyramid developed. Uh, there are various examples of the Egyptians trying to build pyramids and they don't quite work out and they slide or the walls collapse and so forth, uh, like King Unis or something like that. Um, if you don't know how that's done, then you, then you need to just full stop and say, I don't know, so I can't make any claim on it, right? Um, all right, uh, weak analogy, uh, just be mindful of these, right? Arguing on the basis that two things are similar when in fact the similarities between the two are not enough to merit the conclusion. Probably an example of this would be the initial argument by analogy, the teleological argument for the existence of God that we talked about. Um, but again, that argument has been revised and updated by people. Um, but the analogy form is probably not very good. I am not getting that. It is a robocall. Um, okay, bad analogies. I know I'm probably the, my family is the only family that has an actual phone in the Western hemisphere. Um, it's because the 911 calls don't work with your phone. And so if you ever dial 911, then uh, you might have difficulty. They might not know where you are physically. Okay, bad analogies. Just because one argument resembles another doesn't mean that cats can fly in space. So there's a really, right? These things are stacked and they fly. These things are stacked, but they don't fly. Okay, sorry about that phone call. The fallacy of suppressed evidence. Um, this is all over the place in law and politics. The arguer ignores relevant evidence that outweighs the presented evidence, which has a different conclusion. So you see an elephant's ear here and you say, oh, that's a palm leaf. Oh, that's a rope. Oh, this is a tree trunk. Oh, this is a snake. This harkens back to uh, 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 an Eastern story about uh, seven blind mice, I think it is. Um, the idea is that if you look at anything in isolation, you can isolate it and come to dramatically different conclusions, but you have to look holistically and say, hey, that's an elephant, right? Um, when I talk about the JFK conspiracy, this happens a lot. Somebody will say, um, you know, um, 33 people heard shots come from the grassy knoll. Well, yeah, but you know, 46 other people didn't and you're in an urban environment where sound is bouncing off the walls. I don't, I don't know what you want to say there. Um, the idea is that you have to, um, you have to look at things holistically and sometimes people will cherry pick specific particular things and then try to see fallacy. I know it sounds silly, doesn't it? Um, it's when you conclude that a person's position is totally worthless on the basis that they made one fallacy, right? Um, look, somebody may be arguing for the right position in the wrong way. So th this happens often. Somebody says, like, well, Juan is totally wrong about the existence of God because he assumes that what the Bible says is true in order to prove that God exists or something like that. And the idea is, sorry, Bible is not capitalized there. It's just a typo, nothing on purpose, right? Um, the idea is that, um, look, you know, Juan may be correct about, about the position. He's just not doing a good job of articulating the position. And so it's important to always be charitable when you are interpreting other people's arguments. Um, give them the best argument that you can and also realize that one fallacy does not a victory make. Very often positions are, you know, multifaceted and super complex. Um, and one fallacy alone isn't going to call the day. You should call out fallacies, right? But don't don't think that it's everything. And by the way, your in-laws will love it if you point these out or if your parents, if you're living with your parents and you just start popping away, hey, dad, that's a fallacy. Hey, mom, that's a fallacy. Hey, uncle, that's a fallacy, right? Not really. People don't like that. <laughs> they don't like that. But but there are better ways to do, you know, to talk to people. But okay, let's let's go on here. Let's finish up with the perfectionist fallacy. One of my faves, one of my absolute favorites. Um, claiming that a position or action is without merit because perfect results or conformity cannot be achieved. There's no point in raising taxes. Billionaires will just find a new way to dodge many of the new taxes anyway. Well, I mean, it might not be perfect at first, but you know, you might think it's a good idea to raise taxes or something like that, right? Um, compare this case, right? There's no point in prosecuting murder because people are going to just keep on killing each other regardless. Well, n no, right? <laughs> you still want to, you know, I mean, prosecuting people for murder may not be a significant deterrent, um, but it might be some. 
and 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 it's worthwhile to do it. Uh, similarly, with you know, um, you know, right diet or something like that, or your health, and somebody says, "Oh, I just eat like junk all the time because I'm gonna die anyway." Well, okay, yeah, we're all gonna die. I mean, if, you know, there are issues of induction there, but um, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't try, you know, to maybe eat a little better if it means you have better health or something like that. It, it doesn't, as a matter of logic, you know, deliver that conclusion. So um, that one is pernicious. It, it is everywhere, man. People really commit that fallacy when they don't wanna do something. So just be mindful of it. Okay, those were shotgunned to you guys just to get them out. I hope it was helpful. Um, I hope it was illustrative that you saw those fallacies to the extent you feel comfortable being tested on them. If you have any questions or concerns, please folks, contact me on Canvas. I would be happy to answer your questions. Okay, peace. Hi.